Hello, Astrid from Long Hyper Shotgun here. Now, we've already done a preview of Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 using the demo that was available at E3. That same demo was available at Gamescom last week, but when Matthew went to give it a little play, he also found out a lot more interesting information about specifically what we were seeing and also what to expect when Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 comes out at the beginning of next year. So we're gonna go through that and talk about some interesting little details that we didn't have access to before. But first, thanks to Logitech G and the G432 7.1 surround sound gaming headset for sponsoring this video. To check out the tech behind the G432, click the link in the description. So, we already know that when you start off in this apartment, you're about three or four hours into the main campaign. What else we now know is that this isn't actually the apartment that you lived in before you got all vamped. It's actually owned by a guy named Dominic, who is a journalist trying to figure out the Thin Blood situation. He very recently died. You meet him just after the start of the game. He's sent by someone to help you, but is then murdered in front of you by the creepy long-haired guy sitting on the Ferris wheel in the first bit of key art that was released for the game. Uh, he tells you that you're not on his list. We don't know an awful lot more than that. You'll see his little conspiracy board. You can try and follow the threads on that that he found uh, in order to get some side quests that allow you to discover the fates of the other Thin Bloods. Like in the first game, you'll also be able to wander around and just find interesting things to do. We know a fair bit more about the structure of the early hours of the game. Character creation is going to happen at the beginning, but it's also in a way drawn out throughout the first third of the game. You initially choose who you started as in life before you got turned into a vampire, and your time as a Thin Blood is you coming to terms with that. We don't know how, but you will eventually choose a clan to join. At that point, you'll lock in and become a full vampire. So character creation is almost like several rounds or just one long streak of building your character. Bloodlines 1 had a really interesting progression arc for your character. So you started off condemned to death and then you slowly climb up the ranks and gain influence and throw your weight around. This is part of what Bloodlines 2 also offers, but the climb starts from lower down because Thin Bloods are the most human kind of vampire. You have lots of backgrounds to choose from as well. You could go for the traditional Seattle person and be a barista, but there are also more complicated options like being a cop. And you can imagine going into certain situations with a very specific background role, and that might change the way that certain scenario goes. So if you wanted to pose as a buyer in a drug deal, if you were a cop in your past life, you might get recognized and that could completely change how the situation goes. But for now, we're gonna go and get a job from a currently unknown vampire clan in order to gain protection. So we've entered the nightclub and you can see that Mr. Vampire that we're playing is dancing. That dance might be one that you've actually seen before if you've played the original Bloodlines because it featured in that game as one of the dances that you could do. What's fun is that they didn't just copy the animations from the original Bloodlines. What they did was motion cap up a dancer and get them to painstakingly recreate the dance in real life, which is a fun little fact. So this is Elith, who is the faction representative of the clan that we don't actually know about yet. She's going to want to give you some work to do now. You might be able to haggle with her, pick clients against each other, you know, that sort of thing. Create some interesting tension in the vampire culture in Seattle to see how that affects the world. Now, what's really interesting is this mission where you're going to find Slug, multiple faction reps throughout Seattle in the main game are going to offer you a similar sort of mission. And depending on who you take this particular job from, the outcome and the goals would be very different because there are many people in the city who would have loved to see Slug dead and lots of people who could use that data. Here's the money for the information. Make sure Slug delivers. If he attempts to back out of the deal, feel free to use whatever methods are needed to get him to comply. Until then, I'll be waiting here for you. I look forward to your results. So everything in the game we've seen so far has been in nighttime, and that's going to be a relatively consistent feature of Bloodlines 2. 
it's perpetually set at around half past one in the morning. Um, having contact with the obstacle of sunlight when the developers Troika Games were playtesting everything, it didn't feel as fun as you'd hope. It just became this really irritating nuisance. So instead, they just kept the game set during nighttime throughout. You can progress time forward for main quests by choosing to sleep in that apartment. Uh, this is also where you're gonna spend XP and manage your character. Um, so there will be a progression of time. It'll always be at 1.30 in the morning, give or take, but um, it basically gives you the opportunity to take the game at your own pace. So if you've completed a few main quest missions and you want to play some more, you go to bed, wake up at a later point in time when those missions are available. But if you wanted to hang around and explore the world a bit more, play some more of the side quests, you can you can just do that without the pressure of this time limit looming over you. We're walking into the Skeletal Underground now, which is a tourist attraction in Seattle, but it has a very interesting history because in the 19th century, Seattle actually burned down. But instead of just clearing the rubble, the city planners actually just built on top of it all. So the Skeletal Underground is the remnants of old Seattle and there's loads of really dark, dingy, underground city streets, which is an excellent environment for vampires, especially the Nosferatu, which we're coming to see. So every vampire clan has a curse, and the Nosferatu's curse is they suffer from physical deformities. They're very ugly, so they can't go outside, otherwise they violate the masquerade, which is a sort of rule that all vampires have to comply with, where they don't shatter the illusion the vampires aren't real. Now, they're ugly so they can't go upstairs, but it means they're really, really good spies and information brokers. Now, the Nosferatu here, if you've played the first Bloodlines, look very different to the old Nosferatu, which had more of a sort of bat-like aesthetic going on, and they all looked relatively similar. This time around, the variety of gruesomeness was important to the design. The concept artist had a mood board of the new Nosferatu designs, and apparently a lot of people felt really sheepish and squeamish having a look to give you an idea. Because the Nosferatu aren't meant to all be bat-faced. Uh, they are unfortunately physically deformed, but in their own special ways. The other Nosferatu will be different too, as you'll see later. So meeting this Nosferatu character has given you a couple of options. You can stay away from helping out the Nosferatu instead of Elith, and, and just continue pursuing whatever relationship you want to build with the clan that she represents. Or you could help out Samuel and gain the favor of the Nosferatu, which is going to upset Elith because that information won't be able to get to her anymore. So it's all about what kind of character you want to play, what kinds of characters you want to interact with, and it's this really interesting role play opportunity. Now, in this demo, in the demo that Matthew saw, the path with helping the Nosferatu went and explored. But Alice Bell, deputy editor of RPS, who also gave it a go, um, she let Slug go to join the Nosferatus, and he took the info to trade with them, and Eleth was really pissed. Samuel isn't actually the first Nosferatu you will encounter in the game, though. There's another person, we don't have the name of them yet, but because vampires just live for ages, uh, the first Nosferatu you come across is one that was turned in the 80s, so they are adorned in all of these 80s clothing, and it looks like they would never left the decade, which is interesting. So the way characters dress and the time periods that they adorn themselves in can tell you a lot about how long they've been knocking about. Seattle's past is going to come through in Bloodlines 2 quite a bit, um, which is really nice to see. One of the big political struggles in the game, uh, that also is a big political struggle in Seattle, is the conflict between the old Seattle and the new Seattle, which is seeing billions in tech investments at the moment. Um, so that plays a big part thematically in Bloodlines 2, which is reflected in the characters that you meet, and it will also feature quite majorly in the story that will be in the game which is really nice to see. It's great to see that Troika Games isn't shying away from portraying the very political situation going on in Seattle at the moment, especially given that they're trying to make such a faithful recreation of the city. Not exactly one-to-one, -one, but still allowing you to navigate with using landmarks and trying to establish the atmosphere and the feel of the different districts. It would feel like a bit of an oversight to skip past the politics, so it's nice to see this featured.
So we're running into a couple of muggers here, but they're normal human criminals, so they don't really stand up to a vampire, even a thin blood, uh, is, which is what you are. So challenging combat in Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 will largely come from big groups of mortals or some of the more formidable monsters that have powers that stand up to yours. We're entering the jungle now, which is a real location that exists in Seattle. It's a very big homeless camp made up of tents and pop-up shelters. So we might run into some shifty people trying to exploit the local population here. And we're stuck behind this gate in the pursuit of Slug, who we just saw. Now, depending on the powers you picked at the beginning of the game, you'll be presented with a few different options of tackling situations like this. So if you picked Chiropter and then you could glide over long distance gaps because you have bat powers, so you could float out of that window potentially. If you went for mentalism, then you could probably find obstacles in the environment that are obscuring secret pathways and you can move those objects out of the way with telekinesis. But here we have nebulation, which is like mist powers, so you can turn into a big vampire cloud and just float through the air vents. Now, we just fed on someone and they've fallen unconscious. Depending on how much you feed on someone, it can impact what you get from whoever you choose as your victim. Feeding a little bit will grant you some health and some other resources that you'll use as a vampire. Fully feeding will kill your target and grant you a lot of health, but you'll use humanity as you give in to the beast within. Humanity plays a really big factor in what options you're granted in the game, so that'll come up in a moment. Now, as we approach this building, you'll see like a special vampire vision come on and you'll be able to see the different circulatory systems of each of the humans that you come across. Now, there's this new concept in Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 called Resonance. Every mortal has a flavor of their blood. If you look around using heightened senses, you can see this. If you feed on specific types of blood and accrue the resources from them, you'll be able to spec into different things and learn new abilities and bonuses. This is also going to change up how you feed on people in-game, which presents some fun options for roleplay. As the dev demoing put it, you are what you eat. Here there is some sort of trade going on. There's lots of rage and fear that you can see using your heightened senses that gives us an idea of what's going on. We could just go in, but these characters are quite hardened, so it might be challenging. Maybe reach a third floor or sneak through a roof, whatever the case, we just need to get to the other side. What's going on is there's a drug deal. They make the drug upstairs and they're selling it downstairs. So that's why one of the men in the room has the pink desire resonance. Resonances can be more complex though. Uh, desire can also apply to an overwhelming desire for a fix. When you run into a situation like this, you have a couple of dialogue options available to you. You could negotiate or bluff. You could bribe your way through. You could just say, this is a homeless camp. I am a vampire, don't fuck with me. Um, if we had low humanity, then the beast within us could mean that we have less options like this. In this run, we went with a sneaky style, creeping behind and quietly eating people. We got up onto the rafters because of our nebulation powers, and it looks pretty slick because as we'll see later on, the combat animations are still quite janky. Resonance works in really interesting ways as well. Whether you focus on one particular resonance to unlock its merits or mix and match depends very much on how you want to play. You can only choose a finite number of merits to be active at any time. You can mix and match all five resonances, but if you're optimizing for specific playthroughs, then some resonances will have better synergies and it might be more beneficial to specialize. Playing counter to preset ideas like this is part of the Vampire the Masquerade experience generally though, so you can still do that. 
the active skills that you use will be gained from the XP tree, which is different from the tabletop RPG where leveling up skills gave you more dice rolls, which feels great in tabletop but not so great in a video game. There was another VTM game, Redemption, which acted more as a straight adaptation of the tabletop. Bloodlines 2 is more of a hardline successor to the original Bloodlines, but there could potentially be something going on in Redemption sometime in the future if Bloodlines 2 is received well, or so we've heard. So disciplines are an example of this update. Merits instead add flavour and will add different skill buffs, etc. instead of active skills. They're meant to complement different playstyles and Different playstyles is something that you might get a lot of experience with if you pick up the game because it's built for different playthroughs taking different approaches each time. If you don't chase every thread but you want to see the world still, so to speak, it'll take about 30 hours per playthrough and there are multiple endings as well. It's a bit like the Fallout games though because there are combinations of outcomes that affect different groups of people in the world. There are a lot of side quests and main quests that you can play entirely non-violently. It's not a game for pacifist runs though. One of the fundamental ideas is that you're meant to feel like a vampire, like a monster in a society of monsters. Eventually you'll run into moments where there's no way for you to approach a situation without violence, but the body count that you leave behind still very much has an impact. So we found Slug. Now Slug is a thin blood, but he's a thin blood that has Nosferatu blood in him. You saw Samuel, his full Nosferatu clan member, but Slug has sort of the worst of both worlds. He's suffering from all of the deformities that the Nosferatu suffer from, but he's not really getting many of the really big powers that make it worth it. And you'll also notice the dialogue's quite interesting. In Bloodlines 2, the dialogue isn't just black and white. Meaningful conversations are very character driven. You can, you can put XP into charisma and speech and find out information that gives you new dialogue options, but that just sort of gets your foot in the door. You'll still have to pay attention to who you're talking to, the kind of person that they are, and what they would respond well or poorly to. You can We're still f it up. Here. Of cities these nights where if you're ambitious, you can get ahead. Trust me, you're better off. Funny, I don't remember telling you my name. They sent you. Get close before you make your move. We'll see about that. Okay, rats. Time to earn your cheese. Which is what happened here. Now, Slug is a thin blood, uh, like you, but it still makes him a very effective kingpin among homeless humans. So what you're seeing now is a sort of boss fight where he's sicked a bunch of them on you. Uh, this is one of the first sort of boss fights we've seen in Bloodlines 2. Um, they could be some of the weakest bits in the first Bloodlines game. And to be honest, this one doesn't look too much more imaginative, but who knows, maybe some boss fights later on in the game will do some more interesting things. We will just have to wait and see for the game to come out. Now you might be a vampire, but if you're not prepared and your assailants are armed, it will be challenging to fight. Fortunately, you are relatively prepared. You'll also be noticing that the camera is switching between third person and first person a little bit. Bloodlines 2 is primarily a first person game. Uh, the original, uh, when you used melee attacks, it came out into this third person camera view because it was a bit difficult to make it work, but they made it work in this one. So even melee combat, you'll be in that first person perspective. The third person moments in Bloodlines 2 fall into two distinct camps. In combat where there are moves to reorient yourself, like mobility options, an example given that hasn't yet been confirmed, but it's the sort of thing that you should expect this to happen with um, would be if you vaulted over an enemy. And then the other camp is for the really cool stuff, like interesting modes of traversal, like when you're floating, uh, when you're gliding along with your back powers, or if you're dancing, for instance, because one of the big things about games where you're playing as vampires is that vampires are meant to be kind of cool. Like there's this edgy, woe is me, I am a monster element to it, but it's also vampires are cool. I want to be a cool vampire. So the third person camera will engage with moments like that so you can see a cool vampire character. You can't switch between the two willy nilly, but the camera will make sense given the circumstances. 
A lot of your powers are also tied to your blood supply, so even during combat you need to worry about getting a quick feed here or there to keep yourself topped up and combat effective. And to keep the hunger at bay so the beast doesn't come out and cause havoc, though this could be effective sometimes if you want to make use of it to dispatch a bunch of foes, you're always at danger of losing yourself, so there's a risk-reward system at play here. If you'd killed all of the homeless people in the jungle, like in the VTM tabletop, you'd lose a lot of humanity. These actions would be referred to as humanity sins, to the point where dialogue choices change and characters will treat you a lot differently. So now that the combat's successful, we have a few more options when it comes to how to have this conversation with Slug. So we've chosen to let him go if he tells us where the information is, which is in a little tent nearby here. We'll just go grab that. In Alice's run, they let Slug go back to the Nosferatu, but what happened there was Slug took that information with him to the Nosferatu. So you'd go back to Elith and she'd be really upset with you and you'd effectively have burned a bridge with the clan that she represents, but you'd have the support of the Nosferatu. So depending on the playstyle that you were going for, Allyships with either of those clans could present different benefits and different opportunities and make more sense to your character. And it's a really interesting way of providing some fun roleplay opportunities. It would also have been possible to piss off more than one vampire clan in doing this mission. Because this is just a demo, we don't really get to see many more of the clans. The only one that we have actual confirmation on is the Nosferatu. But in the full game, this mission, you'll probably have the opportunity to talk to a bunch of different clans. And depending on what you do on the mission, it could please a few of them, upset a few of them, or upset a lot of them. Which is very interesting. Thanks again to Logitech G and the G432 7.1 surround sound gaming headset for sponsoring this video, featuring 50mm audio drivers, a 6mm mic and DTS Headphone X 2.0 surround sound technology under the hood, the G432 headset immerses you in the action and ensures you'll always be heard for a complete gaming experience. Find out how to order yours by following the link in the description. But that's a bit more of a deep dive into Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 using the demo that we've all already seen, but adding a little bit more lore and a little bit more detail. If you enjoyed this deeper dive into Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2, then why not like the video and subscribe to Rock Paper Shotgun if you want to see more videos like it. Thanks very much for watching and see you again soon.